Hello viewers. Welcome to our today's program. In today's program, we shall discuss about periodical essays and English literature. Periodical essays is an important gift of 18th century to English literature. In today's class, we shall learn what is a periodical essay, different periodical essays during the period of Augustus, and also we will learn about the history of periodical essays. To start with, let us know what are the different objectives of this lesson. To study one of the major movements of English literature in detail and summarize it for better understanding. To analyze the Augustan period from the aspects of periodical essays with a critical appreciation and relation with society. Special reference to the essay writers. Now what is an essay? An essay is any short composition in prose that undertakes to discuss a matter, express a point of view, persuade us to accept a thesis on any subject, or simply entertain. The essay differs from a treatise in its having less affectation to be a systematic and complete exposition and in being addressed to a general rather than a specialized audience. As a consequence, the essay discusses its subject in a non-technical fashion and often with liberal use of such devices like anecdotes, striking illusions and humor to augment its appeal. Periodical essays is one of the most important literary features of English literature. The Augustan age was brilliant literary period with artists such as Virgil, Horace and Ovid under the Roman Emperor Augustus. In the 18th century, Joseph Addison and Sir Richard Steele's Tatler and Spectator with their many successors gave to the essay written in prose standard modern vehicle with the emphasis on social concerns and their ideals of moderation, decorum and urbanity. In today's class, we shall discuss the history of periodical essay in the Augustan age, that is the 18th century and its social perspective through some essays and writers. To begin with, the Augustan age. During the first half of the 18th century, England was in many respects uncivilized. Roads were dangerous and infected with robbers, so it was unsafe to go out after dark. The police and the watch were inefficient and hopeless. Men of letters were often attacked and beaten by the poets or politicians when they had criticized or vilified. Alexander Pope was also threatened by Ambrose Phillips with a rod which was hung up for his chastisement outside Button's coffee house. At a later period when his satires had stirred up a nest of hornets, the poet was in the habit of carrying pistols and taking a dog for his companion when walking out at Twinkham. The later half of the 18th century is an age of reaction, an age of translation, and an age in which there is a marked conflict between the old and new. The men of Pope's time had reacted against the immor immorality of the Restoration era and the excesses of the metaphysical. They made reasons and good sense. Their guides developed a rigid formalism, destructed emotion and enthusiasm, so that the atmosphere of their life and writing became hard and dry. In the age of Dr. Johnson, we find that there is a reaction against the self-complacency, the artificiality, the formalism, and intellectuality of the previous age. There is a renaissance of feeling and awakening 
to the wonder and mystery of the world around. After many conflicts of the mid 17th century in the English society and culture, it settled down into a period of stability until political revolution in France and industrial revolution at home helped to produce another era of more rapid change and more violent conflict of ideas. During this age, it became possible to distinguish the view of life and letters, which was to be considered as Augustine. London became more and more a center of literary and intellectual life of the country due to the influence of writers who came to look at polite London society. The old idealism by which men had lived and over which they had fought and died also became more civilized. Economics and ethic were finally separated. The new economic field was political arithmetic, which proved to their own satisfaction that the individual desire to make money can produce plenty and poverty can only be the result of idleness. Society refused to take responsibility for those of its members who fell by the wayside. In London, the coffee house replaced the court as the meeting place of men of culture. The education and the entertainment of the middle class became a legitimate objective of literature. The difference between the courtesy books of the Renaissance and the essays of Addison and Steele in the early 18th century illustrate with quite startling clarity the differences between the old aristocratic education and the new general variety. To discuss further about periodical essays, we need to know that periodical essay was a new literary form that emerged during the early part of the 18th century. Periodical essay is an important gift of our excellent and indispensable 18th century to English literature. A. R. Humphrey said, if any literary form is the particular creation and the particular mirror of the Augustan age in England, it is the periodical essay. Periodical essays typically appeared in affordable publications that came out regularly, usually two or three times a week and were only one or two pages in length. Unlike other publications of the time that consisted of a medley of information and news, essay periodicals were comprised of a single essay on a specific topic or theme, usually having to do with conduct or manners. They were often narrated by personas or a group of personas commonly referred to as a club. Mostly, readers of the periodical essay were the educated middle-class individuals who held learning in high esteem but were not scholars or intellectuals. Women were a growing part of this audience and periodical editors often tried to appeal them in their publications. The periodical essay found a spectacular response in the 18th century on account of various reasons. Fundamentally, this new genre was in perfect harmony with the spirit of the age. It sensitively combined the taste of different classes of readers with the result that it appealed to all though, particularly to the resurgent middle class. In the 18th century, there was a phenomenal spurt in literacy, which expanded widely the circle of readers. They welcomed the periodical essay as it was the light literature. 
The brevity of the periodical essay, its common sense approach, and its tendency to dilute morality and philosophy for popular consumption paid rich dividends. To a great extent, the periodical essayist assumed the office of the clergyman and taught the masses the lesson of elegance and refinement. Though not of morality or of psalm singing kind. The periodical paper was particularly welcome as it was not a dry, high brown or hoity toity affair like the professional sermon in spite of being highly instructive in nature. In most cases, the periodical essayist did not speak from the clouds, but communicated with the reader with an almost buttonholing familiarity. The avoidance of politics, though not by all the periodical essayists, yet by good many of them, also contributed towards their popularity. Again, the periodical essayist made it a point to cater for the female taste and give due consideration to the female point of view. That won for them many female readers too. All these factors were responsible for the universal acceptance of the periodical essays in the 18th century England. The Tatler in the year 1709 to 1711 and the Spectator from 1711 to 1712 were the most successful and influential periodicals of the 18th century. But there are other periodicals that help shape this literary genre. We shall discuss some of these periodicals through the following modules. The history behind the periodical essay. There is history everywhere. While the periodical essay emerged during the 18th century and reached its peak in publications like The Tatler and The Spectator, it can be traced back to the late 17th century. The most influential periodical essay for The Spectator is John Dunton's Athenian Mercury which played an important role in the development of the periodical essay. The Athenian Mercury began publication in the year 1691 with the purpose of resolving weekly all the most nice and curious questions proposed by the imaginative census. It did not publish an essay. Instead of following a question and an answer or an advice column format, it is one of the first periodicals to solicit questions from its audience. Readers submitted questions anonymously and their candid inquiries were answered by a collection of experts known as the Athenian Society or simply the Athenians. Dunton hinted that the Athenian Society was made up of a group of learned individuals but in reality, the society only consisted of three people who were not necessarily authorities. Their identities remained a secret, however, and this is one of the first instances of a periodical using a fictional social group or club to answer questions or narrate a story. Each issue of the Athenian Mercury would answer anywhere from 8 to 15 questions on topics ranging from love, marriage and relationship to medicine, superstitions and the paranormal. Dunton received so many questions from female readers that he decided to devote the first Tuesday of every month to questions from women. This periodical, originally known as a weekly review, of the affairs of France, perched from the errors and partiality of the news writers and petty statesmen of all sides. The review began publication in the year 1704 
as an eight page weekly. The title, length and frequency of the periodical changed in subsequent issues until it eventually became a tri-weekly periodical entitled The Review. Most issues of the review consisted of a single essay usually covering a political topic which was followed by question and answer section called the Mercure Scandal or advice from the Scandal Club translated out of French. D4 eventually replaced the translated out of French with a weekly history of nonsense, impertinency, vice and debauchery. In this section, a fictional group known as the Scandal Club answered the readers' questions on a variety of subjects including drinking, gambling, love and treatment of women. The advice column component of the review was so popular among readers that D4 began publishing a 28-page monthly supplement devoted entirely to readers' questions. On May 1705, D4 dropped the advice from the Scandal Club from the review and began publishing the questions and answers separately in a publication entitled The Little Review. With their advice column elements, they were obvious imitators of the Athian Mercury. However, the questions and answers in D4's periodicals were longer and mostly written as letters. And this type of prose writing would eventually evolve into a single essay format of the Tatler and the Spectator. Like other periodicals of the time, the advice from the Scandal Club and the Little Review addressed questions of behavior and conduct, but D. Stone was more satirical and he would often mock the stuffiness of the Athenian Mercury in his essays. Defoe's periodicals were also less mannerly and he often placed design for products like remedies for venereal syndrome within their pages. Let's move to the next segment where we discuss about the Tatler and the Spectator. Joseph Addison in the year 1672 to 1719 and Richard Steele from 1672 to 1729, the greatest educators of the English middle class at the beginning of the 18th century were at the same time eager to bridge the gap between town and country, represented at the restoration by courtly fashion of sneering at the uncouthness and simplicities of visiting squires and also to unite past and present to re-establish the continuity of English history. They effectively pooled their talents to achieve extraordinary success in their endeavor, to enliven morality with wit, and to temper wit with morality. Their aim was completely educational. The single essay made its first appearance in the Tatler, which began its publication in the year 1709. Created by Richard Steele, the purpose of the Tatler was to offer something whereby such worth members of the public may be instructed and after their reading, what to think and to have something of which may be of entertainment to the fair sex. Steele was the creator but other significant writers of the time, including Joseph Addison and Jonathan Swift, were also the contributors. The Tatler was a single sheet of papers that came out three times a week and in the beginning consisted of short paragraphs on topics related to domestic, foreign, financial events, literature, theater and gossip, like the journalism developed in the last decade of the 17th 
century. But steel was a little different. Each topic fell under the heading of a specific place such as coffee house where that discussion was most likely to take place. Isaac Bickerstaff, the 60 something fictional editor narrated the tattler and his thoughts on the miscellaneous subjects were included under the heading from my own apartment. In an attempt to appeal to his female audience, Steele introduced the character Jenny de Staff. Isaac Bickerstaff's half-sister and she narrated some of the essays later in the periodicals run. The last issue of the Tatler appeared in March 1711. Steele launched a new periodical, The Spectator, with Joseph Addison contributing 42 of the total 271 papers. The Spectator was published daily and consisted of a single essay on a topic usually having to do with conduct or public behavior and contained no political news. The Spectator was narrated by a fictional persona, Mr. Spectator, with some help from the six members of the Spectator Club. While the Tatler introduced the form of the periodical essay, the Spectator perfected it and firmly established it as a literary genre. Edison, in the first issue of The Spectator, introduced himself as Thus I live in the world rather as a spectator of mankind than as one of the species. He also gave a background like, I was born to a small hereditary estate, which according to the tradition of the village where it lies was bounded by the same hedges and ditches in Williams the Conqueror's time, that is, it is at the present and has been delivered down from father to son, whole and entire, without the loss or acquisition of a single field or meadow during the space of 600 years. It was Addison who developed many of these devices to their ultimate perfection, just as he developed the character of Rog Roger Coverley from Steele's first sketch. In the 70s, Spectator Addison taught his readers that the old ballads were not to be despised. Though they do not obey the rules of the literary critics, the rules themselves are based on nature. And so, human nature and the permanent qualities of men and things, and so even a rude poet who follows nature will find himself doing in however humble a way what the great classical poets did. It consisted in the resemblance and the congruity of ideas while false wit drew on accidental physical resemblance and congruity between letters, words and the shapes of sentences. The Spectator remained influential even after it ceased publication in the year 1712. Other 18th century periodicals including Samuel Johnson's The Idler and The Rambler copied the periodical essay format issues of The Tatler and The Spectator were published in a book form and continued to sell for the rest of the century. The popularity of the periodical essay eventually started to decline, however, and essays began appearing more often in periodicals that included other materials. By the middle 18th century, periodicals comprising of a single essay eventually disappeared altogether from the market. We now move to the next segment of this lesson where we discuss about Dr. Johnson and other periodical writers. In the second half of the 18th century, the periodical essay showed a tendency 
to cease as an independent publication and to get incorporated into the newspaper as just another feature. The series of about 100 papers of Dr. Johnson called The Idler, for example, was contributed to newspaper. The Universal Chronicler appeared between April 15, 1758 and April 5, 1760. These papers are lighter and shorter than those published in the periodical paper The Rambler. The Rambler appeared twice a week between March 20, 1750 to March 14, 1752 and ran to 208 numbers. Dr. Johnson as a periodical essayist was much more serious in the purpose than Steele and Addison had been. His lack of humor and unrelieved gravity coupled with his ponderous English make him make his Rambler papers quite heavy reading. The lack of popularity of the Rambler can easily be ascribed to this very fact. Among the papers that followed the Rambler may be mentioned Edward Moore's World and the novelist Henry Mackenzie's Mirror and The Lounger. A significant development was the creation of the magazine or what we call Digest Today. It was an anthology of interesting material which had already appeared in recent newspapers. The first magazine was Edward Cave's Monthly, The Gentleman's Magazine, founded in the year 1731. The vogue of magazine caught on many magazines, including the magazine of magazines in the year 1750 to 1751, appeared and disappeared. Along with the magazines, it may be mentioned the initiation of the critical review devoted to the criticism of books. The first such periodical was Ralph Griffith's Monthly Review. I'm sure we all have heard about the contribution of Oliver Goldsmith. In the end, we can consider the work of Oliver Goldsmith, who contributed to near about 10 periodicals, including the Monthly Review. His own B in 1759 ran to only eight weekly numbers. The Citizen of the World in 1762. Goldsmith's best work is a collection of essays which originally appeared in the public ledger as Chinese letters. Goldsmith's essays are rich in human details a quivering sentimentalism and candidness of spirit. His prose style is likewise quite attractive. He avoids bitterness, coarseness, pedantry and stiff wit. His style, in the words of George Sherborne, lacks the boldness of aristocratic manner and it escapes the tendency of his generation to follow Johnson into excessive heaviness of diction and balanced formality of sentence structure. It is precisely for this lack of formality and for his graceful and sensitive ease, fluency and vividness that we value his style. Now we need to discuss about the style of periodical essay. Most of the periodical essays used a simple and conversational style so as to be able to understand and appreciated by their semi-educated and unscholarly common readers. Mrs. Jane H. Jack as a critic observes, this periodical writers prided themselves on being nearer in our style to that of a common talk than any other writers. And there can be little doubt that the ubiquity of these essays had a good effect on the prose style of the century as a whole. The periodical essayist could indulge 
in individual whimsies, conceits, witticism or even hard words only at his peril. Women who made up a large proportion of the readers could appreciate such things even less than their male counterparts. Of the style, to be simple and clear. How disastrous an effect the use of a heavy style could have on the popularity of a periodical essay is obvious from the case of Dr. Johnson's Rambler, which never circulated above 500 copies. The Spectator, on the other hand, ran to no fewer than 5,000 copies. I hope you learners have enjoyed today's program. We'll see you soon in our next session. Thank you.